Hey guys, so in today's video, I want to talk about the Zoroastrians. This is a subject that I really don't think gets dealt with enough, and the profound influence that Zoroastrianism had on Christianity, and some of the insights that we can gain from looking at that in detail. Stay tuned. <laughs> After Jesus had been born at Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod, suddenly some wise men came to Jerusalem from the east, asking, Where is the infant king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was perturbed, and so was the whole of Jerusalem. Now, I think everyone is familiar with the famous story of the three wise men coming from the east and offering their gifts to the young infant Christ child, right? But what a lot of people don't realize is who exactly these wise men really were. In the Greek, the word here used is not wise men, but magi. And the magi were a very particular group of people that were living in the region of Iran. In fact, they originate from the city of Tehran within the present day nation of Iran. And the, the, the magi were a tribe of people that belonged to the nation of the Medes. And the Magi were the advocates or the priests of a religion referred to as Zoroastrianism or Mazdaism. Now Zoroastrianism is a relatively ancient religion. It was started by the prophet Zarathustra or Zoroaster who received the law from Ahura Mazda. And Zoroastrian cosmology essentially divided the world between two halves. It was believed that in the beginning the god of light, Ahura Mazda, created a perfect world, a perfect paradisal world where in which there was no old age, sickness, death, or loss. And then Angramanu was a god of darkness who longed for destruction. And he rose up from the abyss and corrupted the world of Ahura Mazda by inserting into it all of these destructive and demonic influences. It was the hope of the Zoroastrians that at the end of time, the son of Zarathustra would be conceived within the womb of a virgin after bathing in a lake, and that this virgin would give birth to the Sao Shiant, the king who would come as the representative of Ahura Mazda and wage war against Angramainu, and that this great war between the Sao Shiant and Angramainu would result in the fact that Angramainu and his, all of his demons would be plunged into the abyss, plunged into hell, and that the Sao Shiant would bring about the resurrection of the dead, the eternal life of his subjects, and a perfect paradise on earth, overseen by the light of Ahura Mazda. read in the 30th chapter of the Bundashim, after Sao Shiant comes, they prepare the raising of the dead. The question is asked, how does the resurrection occur? First, the bones of Gayomar, the first man, are raised up, then those of Mashi and Mashiani, then those of the rest of mankind. In the 57 years of Sao Shiant, they prepare all the dead, and all the men stand up. Afterwards, they set the righteous man apart from the wicked, and then the righteous is for heaven, Garoth Ma, and they cast the wicked back to hell. Then all men will pass into that melted metal, and they will become pure. When one is righteous, then it seems to him just as though he walks continually in warm milk, but when wicked, then it seems to him in such manner as though in the world he walks continually in melted metal. All men become one voice and administer loud praise to Ahura Mazda and the archangels. Sao Shant, with his assistants, performs a Yashin ceremony in preparing the dead, and they slaughter the ox in that Yashin. From the fat of that ox and the white Homa, they prepare Hush and give it to all men, and all men become immortal. They give every one his wife, but there is no begetting of children. 
Afterwards, Sao Shant and his assistants, by order of the creator Ahura Mazda, give every man the reward and recompense suitable to his deeds. This is even the righteous existence where it is said that they convey him to paradise and the heaven of Ahura Mazda takes up the body. Gochir burns the serpent in the melted metal, and the stench and pollution which were in hell are burned in that metal, and in hell it becomes pure. The renovation arises in the universe by his will, and the world is immortal forever and everlasting. This too, it says that this earth becomes an iceless, slopeless plain, even the mountain whose summit is the support of the Chinwad Bridge. They keep down, and it will not exist again. So reading the Bundesheen, which by the way is a kind of a summary of Zoroastrian beliefs that was compiled probably in around the one year 100 or 200 AD, uh, essentially it gives you the sense that you can clearly see the parallels between Zoroastrian thinking and that of uh, New Testament belief. And this is no coincidence, this is no accident. You see, the Jews really didn't entertain any apocalyptic thinking until after the Babylonian exile. When we look at the books of the Bible, we don't see any mention of a great apocalypse until we come to the, the pages of the book of Daniel, which really seems to have come under the influence of this Zoroastrian thinking and really built this thing up as a very Jewish idea. You see, prior to the, to the exile of the Jews into the land of Babylonia, the Jews were looking forward to what was called the Day of the Lord. This was a concept that was really uh, started by Isaiah the prophet and, and Hosea and Joel and many of these uh, biblical prophets who were existing in the land of Israel prior to the Babylonian exile in 586 BC. And the Day of the Lord was this day of great judgment where in which Yahweh would come and visit Jerusalem and destroy her enemies and set himself up as the supreme God and that all the nations would stream from the four directions to worship Yahweh on um, the mountain in Jerusalem. And so when the Jews were exiled in Babylon, it seems pretty clear that they linked these concepts up and that they started to, to, to merge this mythology in such a way as to really start to conceptualize the day of Yahweh as the fulfillment of this Zoroastrian apocalyptic battle. A point which I find really fascinating, especially for our purposes here on the channel, is the role played by Homa within Zoroastrian mythic thinking. The Homa was really the equivalent of the Soma among the Hindus. The Soma was a drink that the Hindus would drink and then they would encounter the gods, and it's believed by most that this was some kind of a psychedelic substance. Well, the Zoroastrians took Homa as the fruit of the tree of life. And so after the resurrection of the dead, it was said that the Sao Shant would distribute the Homa to the, to the risen dead. And as a consequence of that sacred drink, they would achieve immortality. It's now believed that Homa or Soma was probably some kind of an amalgamation between cannabis, ephedrine, and most important of all, the poppy, opium. This is where we get uh, drugs such as morphine and heroin as well. You see, the, the Zoroastrians as well as the Hindus talk about the Soma as being the king of all medicines, that you would take this medicine, you would ingest it, and then all fevers, all pains would disappear, which, well, let's be honest, it sounds a lot like a, you know, a person eating opium, right? This is morphine. This is a, a profound painkiller. In fact, you could still say it's the king of medicines because many of our medicines now are, are made from opium poppy. America is in the midst of an opioid drug epidemic. Driven by escalating opioid addiction, drug overdoses are now the leading cause of death among Americans under 50. People are literally dying in the street. They're dying in their parents' homes. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the opioid epidemic is fueled by prescription pain medications. We, we can pretty, I, I think we can be pretty confident on the identity of, of uh, Homa or Soma with the opium poppy because 
In the Bundeshin, the Homa is listed among a series of flowers, and it's described as a white, uh, a white substance, the white Homa it's described as. Well, this clearly sounds a lot like opium, right? Opium comes from a poppy, and it's, it's, it's the white fluid that comes out of the immature uh, poppy bud that's really used to extract morphine and uh, all these different chemicals. It's also no coincidence that the Magi follow the recommendations of a star. The Zoroastrians were well known for their knowledge concerning astrology, and this largely was inherited from the Babylonians. It was really the Babylonians who really first developed a firm grip on astrology and astronomy at that time. And so when the Magi are said to have come and visited Christ as a result of seeing a star in the sky, it seems to be a direct reference to their familiarity with astrology. We also see the influence of several other mythic ideas coming in from the Zoroastrians. We see the Amentia Spentus in Zoroastrian thought, and essentially these were seven spirits which were uh, sort of the representatives of Ahura Mazda. In fact, we see the same concept within Vedic tradition in the form of the Adityas, but the Adityas expanded the seven into twelve. And this, again, uh, seems to echo what we see in the biblical tradition, right? With the, the prophet Zechariah describing the seven spirits of Yahweh, these seven archangels that uh, stand before the throne of God. And so the Adityas, the Amenshaspentas, and the seven archangels really seem to be a kind of uh, tradition that was distributed across uh, Zoroastrianism, biblical thinking, as well as the thinking of the Hindus. Now, you may be wondering, what is the cause of this parallel? Why is there a parallel between the Zoroastrians and the Hindus? And the reason for that is because Zoroastrian thinking seems to have emerged from the mythic thinking of the Aryans. Now, this is a really important concept for better understanding mythic ideas or cultural ideas within the larger ancient Near East, as well as even into Northern Europe. The Aryans were a nomadic community of people that were distributed across the Central Asian steppes, and it's believed that in around 1500 BCE, they moved down into the Indus Valley civilization, taking over the Indian subcontinent, as well as Iran, and eventually moving up into Northern Europe to found the traditions of the Norse pagans as well. In fact, you can always recognize where Aryan mythology had a significant influence because at the top of the pantheon will always be a thunder deity. We see this in Indra in India, as well as Ahura Mazda among the Zoroastrians, El living on Mount Zephon among the Phoenicians and fathering his son Baal, as well as Zeus upon Mount Olympus, and let's not forget Odin, right, presiding over the court of gods. And this also comes through in biblical thinking in the form of Yahweh living on Mount Sinai, right? This was a, a kind of universal mythic theme that was distributed across all of Aryan culture. And you can see the distinction when you look at the mythology of the Egyptians, who have no such thunder deity at the top of their pantheon. And what's fascinating is that scholars think that this, this Aryan mythology was really centered around this idea that in the storm cloud there was a god, and this god was thundering out with war, right? Every time the storm cloud would come through, the, the sound of thunder and the throwing of lightning bolts was the result of the fact that this good light god was at war with the dark serpent of the abyss, and that the good god was supplying uh, fertilizing rain to the earth, meanwhile the evil dragon was in there trying to prevent the good god from distributing life across the earth. And this is really, you know, this is a common mythic theme. And we see it even in the fact that both the Norse, uh, Norse pagans uh, held the bull or the, 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 the oxen in high significance. It said that at the beginning of the world, there was a cow who licked the first man out of the ice. And we see within Hindu mythology this as well, right? The significance of the cow, the significance of the symbolism of the bull. Indra is said to have rode upon an elephant who was a cloud. We see Yahweh, the rider of the clouds. We see Ahura Mazda associated with a bull who was said to be the storm cloud. And the udders of the, of the cow were thought of as like the rain, right? This, the, the rain creature moving across the sky and spreading milk upon the earth, right? This is a, a very prolific mythic theme that seems to have been distributed by the Aryans. 
Now, I should mention as well that the Aryan invasion hypothesis is very sensitive for Hindus, and if you bring this up, you may find them, you know, vehemently rejecting this and saying, oh, the, the Aryan theory, ah, you know, it's all just a theory, it's never been proven, you know, they get quite hot under the collar over this. And the reason is because the Aryan hypothesis was used to justify racism within India under the British rule. You see, the British figured this out. They said, well, look, the Aryans came in from the north and they were white and they took over India and helped develop Indian culture. And so, you know, the British said, well, look, it's okay for you to be subjugated to us because you were subjugated to the Aryans. And so Hindus are very resentful towards this hypothesis because it was really used to subjugate them at one time. In fact, Hitler picked up on this and he suggested that the Germans were the pure Aryans, that the Aryan race had blonde hair and blue eyes, and so he wanted to purify the German people of any other race, and he really, you know, took this thing up. It was total bullocks. You know, it's rubbish, right? And it's unfortunate that this legitimate point in history has been colored over by this racism, right? But the Zoroastrians, I think, probably represent uh, a, a little bit of a purer expression of this Indo-Iranian belief and this bifurcating of nature, right? Suggesting that nature was presided over by this great sky deity, this, this sky god. And then there's this war within nature between the sky god and his servants and those who live upon the earth, the demons who are always trying to fend off and fight the influence of the great sky deity. And his servants are, of course, the stars, and his eyes are the sun and the moon, right? It's this idea of the great sky being Zeus, Odin, Yahweh, El, right? So what an examination of this does is it allows us to see why Christian thinking was so popular and prolific in its time. And what it also helps to demonstrate is why the biblical tradition was so effective. The Bible was not so profoundly influential simply because, you know, it came down from God and it was handed to people on a silver platter with angels' wings, right? The Bible was really a, a, a product of syncretism. It was the product of Jewish ideas coming together with Phoenician ideas, Zoroastrian ideas, Greek ideas in the form of uh, Plato and Philo of Alexandria and his concepts regarding the Logos. We find that clearly in the Gospel of John, right? El on Mount Zephon is comparable to Yahweh on Mount Sinai. We see the influence of the Cherubim and the Cherubim coming in from the Babylonians and the Seraphim from the Egyptians, the, the, you know, the Seraphim being the highest angels with serpent's wings and all of this, right? This clearly was borrowed from the Egyptians. So when Christianity emerged in the ancient Near East. It was more than just a new religion on the block. It was a profound example of syncretism. It brought together many diverse ideas which were already in, in existence at that time. And I think this really helps to demonstrate that the religions which cope best with diversity are ultimately the ones that succeed because we see within history how Christianity essentially consumed all of these religions, that they were basically amalgamated and swallowed up by Christian tradition. It should also be mentioned that Zoroastrianism seems to also be a major source of a lot of the negative things that we see within biblical tradition, because the Zoroastrians were notoriously superstitious, really superstitious in a lot of negative ways. You see, they bifurcated the world into black and white concepts so bad as to really almost produce a self-induced kind of neurosis. You know, the Zoroastrians suggested that Ahura Mazda created fire, but Angra Mainyu created smoke. The Ahura Mazda created the in-breathed breath, but Angra Mainyu created the out-breathed breath. So that the in-breathed breath was good and the out-breathed breath was evil. Right? <laughs> it's just, you know, and they even went so far as to suggest that the animals were good and evil. So, for instance, the hedgehog was thought to be a blessed animal sent by Ahura Mazda, whereas other animals, you know, the insects and scorpions were animals sent by Angra Mainyu. And it was a, a, an obligation of the Zoroastrian to kill the animals of Angra Mainyu wherever he found them. In fact, 
fact, you know, there's a, a popular uh, video game series that actually reminds me quite a bit of Zoroastrianism, and that's the Diablo franchise, right? Where you have the angels in the heavenly realms waging war against the demons of the of the deep dark abyss, right? This is this concept that underpins the uh, uh, the, the whole Diablo franchise, right? And in the images of the hero wandering through the deserts, you know, slaying demons, I mean, Zoroastrians would have picked up on that right away. They had probably the most complex and well-fleshed-out demonology of any religious tradition out there. But this really resulted in the fact that Zoroastrian thinking was incredibly disassociative. It was always casting things in a good or evil light. And as a result, they had very weird traditions. Like, for instance, it was punishable on pain of death to bury a body or to cremate a body. You see, they regarded the four elements as being created by Ahura Mazda and therefore sacred. But to bury a body would be to desecrate the earth because the death of a body was a result of the work of the demon or to cremate a body would desecrate the fire we seem to have some of this thinking influencing the Jews right because in the book of Leviticus we see you know this idea that if you touch a dead body you're ceremonially unclean similarly also the Zoroastrians would feed a menstruating woman her food on the end of a very long spoon because they were afraid that you know in touching the woman they would be uh, exposed to the demon responsible for menstruation we see a similar kind of superstition in the book of Leviticus right women who are menstruating are considered to be ceremonially unclean to touch semen is considered ceremonially unclean. To, to sow a field with two kinds of grains is, a, is a, a sin against Yahweh. And it seems to me that there's a pretty good suggestion here that the Levitical traditions, the book of Leviticus, was probably added by the priestly traditions while the Jews were in Babylon. And this seems to be supported by the fact that we see in the writings of, of the prophets, like Jeremiah, these passages where Yahweh says, I never told the Jews anything about ritual sacrifice while they were in the wilderness. Well, I mean, that, that negates the whole book of Leviticus. And it's also strange because when we come into the New Testament, we see Jesus negating many of these Levitical traditions, such as the traditions associated with resting on the Sabbath day, right? Uh, eating purified foods, right? Not eating foods that are un clean. Well, again, this seems to echo Zoroastrian thinking. So it's interesting how New Testament tradition keeps many of these Shao, these Sao Shiant ideas, these ideas of the messianic king who will restore the world, while rejecting some of these more superstitious elements of Zoroastrianism. So I think that it's important to, again, recognize, and I mean, this is something we visit many, many times as a theme here across this channel, that religious thinking is developmental. I mean, reading the book of the Zen Vesta or the, the Bundashin, I, I can clearly see that there is profound mystical uh, truth hidden here. You know, Ahura Mazda is described as a being of all-encompassing light, pure luminosity, goodness, truth, and love, which clearly seems to echo an encounter with the Dharmakaya, the white light that we often talk about here on the channel. But it also is polluted by many of these more superstitious ideas. And some of you might be thinking, well, if these prophets, if these so-called mystics were really encountering the truth, then why do we see their ideas all muddied up with many of these superstitious ideas? Well, the reason is that many of these people were entering altered states of consciousness without a firm egocentric uh, framework, okay? You've got to understand that their psyches were very susceptible to fragmentation. You know, Carl Jung talked about this as the loss of soul, right? Where if the ego comes under too much emotional distress, the psyche will begin to fragment into diverse pieces. This is really where you get split personality disorder. It's something we still observe to this day, right? Where essentially, if you come under too much trauma, the psyche will cope with that by dividing itself into different personalities and you can end up with one body uh, playing host to several different people. And this seems to be the result of the fact that many of these mystics were going into these altered states of consciousness and then struggling to keep the psyche coherent, keep the psyche together, right? To recognize and accept both the good and the bad things in life. Even when I was little, for 
when I first thought that there was, you know, something different about me, I was listening to these shoulder angels and I literally thought like there was like an angel and a devil like on my shoulder, like in the cartoons, and that they were just helping me like decide regular things about my life. And honestly, I thought everybody thought that way. I thought everybody had these like voices in their head that were like, oh, do this, no, do this. And, you know, finally I started to tell somebody about it and they were like, not everybody thinks like that. How many personalities do you have? Um, I think I have 12 and... And I think that really Christianity represents a kind of harvesting. You know, many of these Zoroastrian ideas were significant, they were useful, and so they were taken and then the other stuff put down. And so we can really recognize that a similar thing happened with the Bible, right? Where the New Testament takes many of these Old Testament themes of God's love, God's mercy, God's kindness, but then puts away and puts down many of these older uh, Old Testament ideas, such as the notion of haram, you know, going into a city and murdering everyone, including the women and children, and, you know, sacrificing it all to the God, right? This is something we see in the Old Testament. Well, thankfully, we don't have Christians going around, you know, invading the city of Philadelphia and saying, hey, listen, we're going to kill all of you and sacrifice it to the God, you know? That's, so there's clearly an evolution of religious ideas. And then ultimately, you know, the, a great tool in this is syncretism, bringing diverse religious ideas together, recognizing the parallels and discerning the points where in which mystics have succumbed to the, to the bifurcated tendencies of the psyche, where they've succumbed to these traumas. And I think it's no small coincidence that we see this radical bifurcated, this radical dualistic thinking in a religion that was using opium. <laughs> you know, let's be honest, uh, the, the influence of opium on their psyche was probably not a positive one. It clearly influenced the mythic thinking, but obviously a person who is relying on a substance like that is naturally going to develop a very disassociative psyche. Right? When they're high, when they're on the opium, the world is a paradise. They feel great. There's no pain. There's no suffering. There's no disease. And then they come down off the high and boom, everything is pain. Everything is suffering. So it seems pretty clear that this altered state of consciousness, using morphine, using you know opium poppy, was uh, not conducive to a comprehensive and, and, and and syncretizing uh, effect on the psyche, right? Which really monotheism, I think, helped to remedy. And, and so for that reason, Zoroastrianism is terribly fascinating because it gives us a window into the development and evolution of consciousness in the human psyche. How the human psyche has evolved through these mythic forms of thinking to emerge into what we have today. And I think that it also serves to tell us where we should look at Christianity, maybe in slightly different ways. That we should lean away from from these uh, dualistic and bifurcating tendencies of the tradition, these apocalyptic tendencies within the tradition, and move more so towards the unifying, the more rational, the more emotionally peaceful tendencies within the tradition, right? I often like to joke and say that evangelicals are more Zoroastrian than they really are Christian, because Christianity is not superstitious, or at least it's not supposed to be. The image of Christ hanging on the cross would have been apprehensive. It would have been totally unacceptable to a Zoroastrian who regards the dead body as being ceremonially unclean. And so the effort of Christianity was really to bring these opposites together, to see the will of God even in the misfortunes and sufferings of life. And so I would really encourage you guys, if you're fascinated by Zoroastrianism, you can go ahead and order these books online. This is the Bundeshin, which is a, a great resource for understanding Zoroastrian beliefs. You also have the Zen Vesta, and this is actually the last remaining uh, portion of Zoroastrian scripture that there is. Now, I should also issue a word of warning. A lot of this stuff is, is very boring. I mean, the Zoroastrians had a lot of rules and rituals revolving around, you know, how many times somebody should be whipped for burying a dead body, or, you know, how many times somebody should be whipped for molesting the sacred fire, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff. So I would really encourage you guys, if you found this video helpful, like, subscribe, and share. Be sure to hit that notification bell so you know when I come out with new content. I also want to mention again that I am working on a course on Udemy. Uh, there's different things available on Etsy as well. I'm hoping to maybe come out with some shirts and hoodies at some time. I will mention that when it comes out. And so I hope you guys enjoy our Facebook group, the Enlightened Discussion Forum. And as always, thanks for watching.